Thank you, Alvin, for joining us on Cloud Native Islamabad, a guide to DevOps workshop. And this workshop aims to help you understand the fundamental required to get into the world of DevOps. What do we mean by building, when we say we are building a CI CD pipeline, the key responsibility of a DevOps engineer, and how to combine best practices and tools to reduce the time from dev to production cycle and to break down silos between the team previously mentioned developer operation and QA. And today I'm joined by the author of one of the most renowned repository, 90 Days of DevOps, Michael Gate. Hey, how's it going? Wonderful, Happy to wonderful. Be here. Thank you. Thank you very much for being on the show, being on the uh, workshop. So, so can you, let, can you tell us like uh, what is happening in Michael's day-to-day -day routine on these days? Oh, well, I've kind of had a bit of a break from writing so much um, because so the whole point of this 90 days of DevOps was, it was a kind of an idea that I had maybe October time last year where I started thinking about some some of those major things like you just mentioned around things like CI CD pipelines, things like infrastructure as code, things like public cloud and having, we have to know a lot about a lot of things, right? Kubernetes, containerization, everything that goes along with that. So I wrote this blog, put it onto Kasten's website and, uh, and it was basically called, so you want to learn DevOps and it got loads of views and it kind of, uh, it kind of started thinking about, right, well, like that's all good, but I'm no expert in any of these or all of these, at least I've touched a bit of infrastructure as code done quite a bit around containers and Kubernetes. And as you do on uh, new year's Eve, you start thinking, right, okay, we're going into the new year. So starting on the 1st of January, I decided that that first 90 days, so 1st of January to March the 31st is exactly 90 days. So first three months of the year, good, great for fitness um, challenges and stuff like that. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to spend 90 days and I'm going to deep dive into the, all of these different areas. And it just so happened that we could spend, I think I spend like six days maybe talking about a high level overview of 90, uh, of DevOps, a bit of an introduction. And then each of those 12 topics, 13 topics split down into seven. So one week makes gets me to the 90 days. So it's like, right, that's the initial plan. Now I have no idea what the rest of it looks like. So we were very much, and I was literally going through them, writing them, living that for 90 days. Um, but I, I think probably before even that, just to introduce me and where I've come from in this world, right, is... Um, so I work for a company called um, Veeam Software, or more to the point, I look after, from a technologist point of view, the Kasten by Veeam, so the Kubernetes backup focused um, product and, and tool set and some of the open source projects there. And it's really my focus to be like a DevRel type position, but also be that technologist, the evangelist of, of our technologies. And we all know like we've been listening in that some of us have been around this space for a while. Some of us are very new, a lot of, like, and, and the, the group is getting bigger. The community is getting bigger. Um, so it's about raising awareness of all things Kubernetes, data services within Kubernetes. There's no point in just talking about backup straight away. So we have to talk, talk about the wider, wider ecosystem. So that was really the, the, the key part of, of uh, how 90 days of DevOps came about. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for because because when you, when you last time we met on the Cloud Native Islam Ward, we do a workshop on Cubester, and you are just starting your journey, and, yeah. and you're telling I think it's, it's just two weeks from your 90 days of journey, and on those days they were telling about what's going to be happening next, and as of today, is the popularity is going up so much, stars so much appreciation translated in so many other languages. That's a great, great journey to be to be in. Absolutely. Yeah, like so. Obviously, like if you think about the repository, it was my idea of just creating notes, like learning in public, sharing some exercises on each of these topics, getting my like understanding what what they are, how they work, getting hands on, and then writing basically a blog post every day for ninety days. Um, other people can obviously follow along. I did it in public on on a Git get site and I'll show you that shortly but um yeah it was uh 
I didn't no, there was no like I think I, I don't even know how many thousand stars there are. It's ridiculous. Um let me just have a quick look. So it's uh sixteen thousand eight hundred and fifty-five, which is bonkers. Ah, oh, yeah, your shirt. Uh sorry for the inception. Um yeah, basically sixteen thousand eight hundred and fifty-five stars, which by all accounts, like these are just my notes. There's a lot of people also that have fought the the repo and and like taken it upon themselves to walk through the 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 um like the process and maybe they're only taking bits of it or they're making it better for them and their teams. I've, the amount of um, discussions I've had about where people have taken this and they've leveraged the what I've done and then they've given it out to their team to onboard them into that DevOps position, which is like truly humbling. It's brilliant. But really it was just me creating notes. So the next thing that's blown me away is around the contributors. Like again, these are just my notes. 54, like there's a couple of bots in there as well. So less not less but 50 people by all accounts have dived into it they've maybe they've just fixed some spelling and grammar for me and that i think that's a very important um thing when it comes to open source it's very hard to understand where to go to get that green tick get the knowledge get the experience find documentation which is all this is really and like use your skills around like the language that you can help make things look better and then even more mind blowing is the ver the, the different languages that have been been created like the chinese japanese po polish i know there's a spanish fork that's happening as well yeah, it's truly like incredible but that's a, probably enough about this like if you haven't seen it 90 days of devops.com will get you to this this repo there's no fancy website behind it i think that's probably another good point is like why i chose why i chose get github to 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 um to host it one was public two was i want to eat or eat my own dog food or drink my own champagne because by doing that in a version control system it enables me to like use those common git commands from my local machine uploading that looking at um, pull requests looking at forks looking at different versions if we look at the different branches that we have available to us I have Gitbook. I've been looking at how we book bookify this from an ebook point of view and using ebook as a website to be able to do that. So a couple of branches getting to understand Git, but also Git based services. And really like so things like we we kick things off with an introduction into what is DevOps or what what is the what is my goal? What do I want to achieve out of it? But but all, all, almost this this touches on what is DevOps um and like a, a few bit, bits of information there but what you'll find in every single on every single day of the 90 days regardless of the topic these are the smart people these the the resources and they're generally like free well they're no they're all free apart from where i state but generally speaking they're free um, resources on on the youtube channel so like i i they're the smart people that I'm learning from. And then I take that and I go, okay, how can I, how can I take their example and how can I um, adapt that? How could I make something of my own? Like the, the, the next, the first section was around um, learning a programming language. Um, and I took some sort of Twitter bot type um, uh, scenario and wanted to create something whenever I, do something I want you to automatically tweet how many days into the project you are. Something no one will ever use, but it was a good way of being able to understand a bit more about APIs, but then also about the Go programming language. I think it's also important here, like, so I broke these down into sections and I've had a lot of questions either through issues or discussion boards. Like, do I need to start with learning a programming language? That No, the whole point of what I did here was but like if you want to, if you want to start with what is and why do we use DevOps? That if if you're starting your learning journey, that absolutely makes sense. But your next stage doesn't need to be learning a programming language. You can jump straight into the Linux basics, or maybe you've already got a good Linux understanding, and maybe you already know Go. Like maybe you want to jump down to understanding a bit more 
about the infrastructure side, understand a bit more about networking and cloud providers. So all of these kind of go through that that process. And interesting enough, like so from the cloud provider point of view, this actually I went I went to the powers of Twitter and ask asked what one should I cover? I think I uh maybe it's in the next day. But you can see here, like, so I've gone through, I've created all these slide decks, and there you go. Like, so I I always start every section with a big picture, like what is the cloud? How might some people consume it? Like we've got obviously here, you've got a lot of different options. We've got on premises, we've got infrastructure as a service, we've got platform as a service, software as a service. We might be using all of that. We might be using some of that. Like, yeah, that, that it's different depending on where you are. Then it gets a bit, and I, I said to stick to one cloud provider. I think that might have been in the blog. But um, so I went out and asked asked the Twitterverse what what should we what should I cover? Now I'm quite lucky in that I've got access to all three public clouds and have a good understanding of all of them. So I was asking, which ones do I cover? Now you can see here, less than a, this was there was still nine hours left. But basically, the the winner of this was Microsoft Azure. So we went into more of the compute, the storage, and the networking around that, and some some some, some scenarios around that. And then the amount of interaction that I've had since has been around um, like, oh, can you cover AWS or could you cover Oracle Cloud or xyz cloud um just to see how that finished the tweet should still be there so yeah you see there that microsoft is your but then closely followed by aws and actually i was gunning for google because google was probably the one that i haven't touched as much so i wanted to actually go and do that so i truly wanted to ask the community and by this point we were getting we were getting some um some traction in the uh in the in the community for this uh for this repo so um yeah so like sticking to one cloud provider then then we got into using git effectively so there's a lot of um understanding more about git installing git on your local machine whether that be linux windows mac myths surrounding it what is it is it too heavy has no access control blah 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 uh, then built out a cheat sheet. There's some amazing people on Twitter actually that make much better cheat sheets than me. Um, much more uh, graphical and 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 pretty to look at. I just simply use tables in Markdown to put these together. But just thinking about like those commands that I was using on a daily basis to to uh, to upload new days or new content into the repository. I'm basically using these these commands all day every day. So getting used to them and putting them into the, the muscle memory. Um, containers, if you're thinking about DevOps, um, process principles, tooling, um, I think you've got to think about not just containers and Kubernetes. I think that's definitely obviously the, the big thing out there at the moment. And a lot of people are looking to skill into that area. But equally, I think we also need to know about virtual machines and we need to know about IaaS and we need to know about a lot about a lot of things. And I think that's my my key takeaway here is DevOps means a lot of things. Like this this alone isn't isn't complete. There's still a lot more that I've already got and I'll get onto it later. But um there's still low I could easily pick another twelve. You could easily do nine hundred days of DevOps and hats off to anyone that that does that um but so infrastructure as code i took terraform because i had that i had that understanding of terraform um so i went through that put it into different areas like creating vms creating cloud-based workloads creating and configuring docker containers and kubernetes etc then configuration management so i chose ansible there and all the things that go with ansible and there's probably a good time to to just like talk about all of the technology that I use here, I wanted to strongly use free and open source tools. I didn't, or community editions that were fully functional. I didn't want to put barriers up for people that are maybe students that don't have access to um, funding, particularly like the cloud, cloud-based credit cards and stuff and, and funding around that. So I wanted to use free and open source or community edition type type tool sets around this this whole journey. Um, CICD pipelines, 
like I would say that every day I learned something absolutely new here, like CI, CD, um, some of the history of that, what what was there before, what was what's there today. I started off with Jenkins because I feel like that's an inherited um, uh, CI, CD pipeline tool that we see out there in the field. However, we're definitely seeing much more around things like GitHub Actions, GitLab, Argo CD, Flux, etc. So I cover some of that in there as well, and and start to like get hands on basically all the way through this. You're going to see like uh, building a Jenkins pipeline, and and what I do, and my intention is to create more YouTube content around this as well because I'll, I'll talk about a bit how I learn, um, and I expect some of you on the on the call will be exactly the same, but. Things like building the Jenkins pipeline. It's one. It's great to see a blog like that if that's how you consume and that's how you learn. And hopefully, some people get value out of that. But then, like me, I'm I'm watching a few videos to get to this point. I'm trying to understand how it works from a video content point of view. So I basically run through building out that. So I, as part of these seven days, we go and deploy Jenkins in our environment. I think actually I use Docker containers to deploy, and then we start to build out a CD pipeline for an Echo, like a Echo or a Hello World type app, and then we start pushing that up into um, into our I think Docker repository, and then we pull that down, version change, etc., and then we start to understand by doing what a CD pipeline or what a CI pipeline looks like as well. And you can see I documented everything. I even document the bad things as well. There's there's a couple of days where I'm like, I have no idea how this worked or it didn't work. So I've documented that saying this doesn't make sense. And then I've gone back later and, and fixed that. I can't remember where it where it is off the top of my head. And then wrapping up. So bear in mind, like I'm at the last 14 days of the challenge, back end of March. I've done a lot of writing so far. Then we get on to monitoring, log management and data visualization. And I'm not saying that this order comes in the order that we generally see in the enterprise or in the in our in the field, but monitoring, log management, data visualization. Then you see the last section, store and protect data. They're always further down the list. They're always they're never the the most exciting. And given that I work in protecting data, um, I was just being honest about what that looked like. So, but again, we're using free and open source toolkits. We're using um, or projects or, or tools along there. So I talk about some of that awareness. There's some stuff around data services, in particular around databases and different databases that you're going to come across. Um, but yeah, it was very much, well, it was, so around, if we were to convert it all into a Word document right now, it'd be around 110,000 words and 700 pages if that, if we were to convert it into something like an ebook, which I feel like that's a big ebook and probably would take a while to load. So I've left it as a as a GitHub repository and not gone down the book route. Um, not sure if anyone really needs that all in a physical book as well. Um, but this this really does blow blow it out of the water. If you think about where we started on on um, on uh, January the first, and then you could probably say that we finished about here. We were at the 5K mark already, and then somehow, some crazy way, it's managed to get up here to that 16 and a half, 17,000 stars in just what are we? August, eight months. So, yeah, um, a huge, um, a huge project, and and I guess that leads on to the next next phase. But I wanted to see if there's any any questions before I uh, before I jump in any further. Yes, absolutely. Some wonderful comments on the chat I, from Epic Code. I made a small notion page where I have written all points and stack I need to learn. So your repo helped me a lot. Thank you so much for your notes, Michael. And also for the Sayed Raza, did you did you plan to make more short for professional to shift DevOps to DevSecOps in thirty days? Um. No, but that sounds like someone should take that that challenge and and put that into like that's that's what it's all about, right? Um, interesting the mention around DevSecOps, and I'll, I'll, let's park that before we get to like we'll go to the other questions. But I've got an interesting play on that. You'll notice actually there was no security 
mentioned there. So I'll, I'll get to I'll get to what's next um, in a in a second as well. But if, are there any other questions? I think uh, that's a that's an interesting interesting question. Like, would AI tools kill DevOps in the foreseeable future? Like, so personally, I don't I don't believe so. Um, I think they're just going to help us in a way. They're going to help us automate the 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 uh, repeatable tasks out of the way. But you're still going to have to think about the principles, the process, and the tooling that allows us to do that. We're still going to be the gatekeepers of putting that technology in place. And we're still going to have to provide the platform and that link between the developer and the, the operations team to make sure that they can deliver on their on their job and on what they need. I think it's important as well. Like so, again, we go back to like the programming language. We think we see things like from a from a GitHub code code spaces perspective from an AI, just a simple AI thing that we've all heard of. Is that gonna? That's not gonna remove the requirement for a developer. It's just gonna make a developer's life, hopefully, a little bit easier. So I think I think that is it's definitely interesting. But yeah, for whatever we can automate, I'm um, I'm all in favor of it, and we should we should do more of it. Yes, and one more question for you, Michael. Kindly share the ah. new upcoming repo plans. <laughs> yeah. So so really the next. Step is um so one I want to get ahead of it instead of waking up on New Year's Eve and going oh I've got to go and write something um I actually want to try and get ahead of it before the ninety days so people can actually follow along as well because I feel like plus it takes a lot of weekends as well because I was writing on the weekend as well but um so the idea is is that you've probably noticed for those that have been to the um been to the uh, repo that there's a very little that focuses on security so the mention of devsecops is massively important so i feel like there's a there is a um i have a plan i have an outline that i want to try and to achieve again of 12 different topics a high level overview of what devsecops is and i've got the the wire frame of what that needs to look like but expect to see a lot more about secrets management around what what that like the different terminology that you see as well like it's not security isn't a uh, you don't bolt on i know i'm bolting it onto this but it's not a bolt on it needs to be included at each stage of the devops journey um we need to think about it from our platform point of view so whether that's kubernetes OpenShift, or serverless we need to think about what that looks like how do we make sure that we're secure from start to finish and ongoing, right? That's the that's the key. So there's a lot of acronyms that I've already found in there that that we need to think about. Um, also, again, massive shout out to the community that have taken on this, um, talking already about like their particular security method. But I don't feel like there's one repo type resource that goes. This is what all of this security from end to end looks like, and there's no, there's no, not real one vendor that has the skin in the game that wants to do that either. And that, I think that goes back to where, where I'm coming from is that, like, I'm ever so lucky. Veeam give me the opportunity to do this. Um, Veeam don't have really any skin in the game when it comes to security. They're the last line of defense from a backup perspective. But really, we we I want to be talking about the prevention of security issues versus the remediation so it's there's no skin in the game so and i think that that's also massively important because if you've got your security vendor a they're gonna talk about product a as well right and i again i'm not into that i don't i, I want to look at what's to, what's hot what's topical let's see what um let's see what we can learn and all the way through this, I'm quite clear in that look, there's a, there's other things available. Like when I looked at HashiCorp um, Terraform from an infrastructure as code perspective, um, I, I shout out things like Pulumi. Um, I think I shout out things like Crossplane as well. And just that that whole part, it's just I chose Terraform because I had a had a good understanding of that as well. But there's obviously others that you could go and replace. Rin you could literally replace everything that I covered with other things. 
So that kind of, well, hopefully that gives you an idea. So DevSecOps is the key, like the overarching theme, but I still think like I want to cover stuff. I want to dive into OpenShift. I want to dive into serverless. I want to dive into service mesh, um, which you could kind of put into that security bit, maybe a little bit as well, right? Um, but the bulk of those 12 big topics is going to be around security. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And as you mentioned, like security is not just a last day job. It's a day one from the from day one. You have to redesign your thinking, you redesign your architecture, and have you have to rebuild and re-architecture your system to have security baked into it. But because when you look at the containers world, they're right now. There is so much into it. Like you have so many build, image building tools like Docker, Bulk, Bilja, Conico, KO, so much tools available and so much registries into it. And also right now we have so much noise going on, the software bills of material, supply chain security. So I yeah. think it's I think we have to combine DevSecOps and DevOps together. It's not 100%. a separate thing. It's a one thing, but it's a two different names. And you can think about it like you always think about security for the day one. Otherwise, it's so challenging because everything is in place and you think the security is not into it. Let's imagine that like we have put a container in the Kubernetes cluster that had 10,000 vulnerabilities into it. Why do we do that? So we have to think about you have a, a right now we have a tools uh, and we have a Docker extensions that can tell you we have seven, uh, 17 different vulnerabilities. Go yeah. fix that up. So I think security is getting momentum, momentum, because people are right now thinking about how do we incorporate security from day one, not just somebody else's job. Because in, in our organization, I think people feel like I'm, I am a developer. It's not my job. I am a DevOps engineer. It's not my job. It's a security engineer's job. But I think it's everyone's job to make system absolutely 24 by 7, always resilient, fault tolerant, and you can deploy your system to production any day and, and you anytime you want. Yeah, and I think things like policy management is another key area that we should consider. And then that does absolutely land on the, the developer and the ops team. And obviously from a platform engineering perspective, is how do we how do we ensure that we we stay in our swim lane and that we can only deploy our application if it has this policy, this and ticks all of these boxes, I think. But yeah, so that's the that's the plan to um to like hit on that next. And probably around we need to get KubeCon out of the way in North America. And then I want to start trying to doing doing a little bit more. I'd be interested, like, so if anyone on the on the call, um, I'd be interested in, in like is the repo enough? Would you like to see it as an ebook? Would it be useful? Um and or a physical book as a potential free giveaway at, at, at an event. Like I've kind of got, uh, I've had marketing teams reach out and basically I've gone, I don't think it's worth it. So I'd be interested to see what you, what you all think. Yeah, I, I, I need that to be honest with you. I ebook 90 days of DevOps, people can go it, read it offline, in a train, in a bus, anytime, free time, only in the parking. I need that for me, but we have this conversation going for that. I think that uh, in the future, like I think it's a good idea to have that ebook as well. And another one question for you, Michael, is that why why are different why are why we are different from SRE? Is it an upgrade from a DevOps? Uh, <laughs> I think if you think about um, site site reliability engineering, it's more about the platform, the underpinning foundations, the, the infrastructure underneath and making sure that that's up and running. There are a lot of, um, if, if we're going to get like, so my opinion is that the role should not be, you should not be a DevOps engineer. And like, that's a huge, everyone goes, what a, what a thing to say. But I just feel like DevOps is, I don't know the age of everyone on the call, but, um, <laughs> I remember ITIL, right, as a processor, as a principal, we had to adhere by um, a certain service management ITIL, like change request type type methodology. DevOps is that, right? As, as much as that's a very boring thing, 
DevOps is that. DevOps is the process and principles that you need to adhere to or abide by in order to deliver platform, in order to deliver your software delivery, your software stack, your supply chain. SRE is about keeping the lights on, making sure that it's available, making sure that people are making backups or making sure that it's scalable for the application, making sure that the end user, whether the end user be a developer or the end user being a customer or a, a, an employee, making sure that it's available. That's the way I would look at that. So I don't think there's an update or an upgrade or and then you're going to start to see terms like platform engineers. And that's, again, I think that actually fits better than your DevOps engineer, because I feel like a platform engineer, if you're a platform engineer, I'm probably looking after physical servers. I'm probably looking after virtualization, VMware. I'm probably looking after cloud-based infrastructure. I'm probably looking after EC2 instances, um, relational database services, like PaaS-based databases. I'm probably looking after some base, some SaaS services as well, Salesforce, et cetera. And I'm probably then looking after some cloud native stuff, Kubernetes, and, and then even more serverless functions as well. And a platform engineer needs to have the scope of all of them because none of them are going away. That's the another spoiler is virtualization is staying, physical machines are they they have to stay in some parts. So we have to be able to work across all of them and we have to have an understanding and be able to bring those same methodologies across all of them. And I think, so I don't think there's any right or wrong title. I've just said the wrong, I've just said that about DevOps, but I feel like the sysadmin in general is evolving to have to have more skill sets around DevOps. The virtualization admins that I've been speaking to for the last, five to 15, like 15 years, are all looking at automation. So it's like the platform side is coming up one side, the developer is having more awareness, and they all meet in the middle to bring, to make sure that they're not throwing code over the fence, and then the operations team's running around with the international sign of help me. Um, but yeah, so I hope hopefully that helps with the SRE question. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I think when you look at the Google uh, SRE book, and when you talk to the Google people, they always think about this, they coined this term called SRE implements DevOps. So they coined this term. And exactly. like, and when you talk about the SRE, is actually people thinking about, we have a developer that has a, so much knowledge about writing and building your application code. And then you have a experts who can understand the niche problem like when this is hit it when you when you uh, like architecture your api when you create your api it's going to be accessible from the different places how would you make sure that these apis when called having a very much latency into it these are not broken over the while and i think these are the most like uh, more sra background but i think right now like we, when you talk about kubernetes and the kubernetes manage offering especially people having some eks cluster aks cluster gke cluster and people you know like in the cloud native space have making solution for the people like we manage your eks cluster we can manage your aks cluster we can manage your gke cluster and for that people i think they're looking for the sre people because at yeah. the end of the day you want these cluster to be always sit and relax and being functional all the time so I think right now it's focusing is toward SRE, but but it's difficult. Like how you how you define or this kind of stuff is is. Don't you think about the simplest way like SRE implement DevOps? I think it's like it's a good way to think about. Uh, so yeah, exactly that. Now I know that there are there will be people that watch this that are DevOps engineers and have, like I, I've always had a thing about titles anyway. Like it, you do what you do, right? And, if you're a systems administrator, that was a blanket term for many years where if you're a sysadmin at company A and a sysadmin at company B, that doesn't mean you do the same job. Like, like you can look after different services and you might be different skills in, in each one, right? And I think I think the DevOps engineer works for some companies. Um, but is it the right, like you, yeah, exactly what you said is, you adopt the principles and processes of DevOps. And you could be a cloud engineer and do that. 
You could be a sysadmin and do that. You could be a platform engineer and do that. But I would th I always think about DevOps as the this is the this is the rule. This is the book, the rule book. This is how we're going to do things. And and also like you let's say you do get and I'm going to use the term DevOps engineer. And there's actually quite a good um part around this in in the uh in in the repo which is the responsibilities of a DevOps engineer. And then in there, we actually talk about, actually, is it a DevOps engineer that we should be calling this position? But um, the whole point of that is, uh, one, discussing that out in the open so that we're all aware of it. But, um, yeah, looking at the different roles and responsibilities. Now, the big thing is, is that if you're a DevOps engineer here and you're a DevOps engineer here, like that's this admin, you might here have to have the knowledge of CI and CD pipelines because you're a software development house. You're creating software, containerizing it, and then pushing it to your Docker hub or some sort of container registry. And then you're also releasing it into the wild. But over here, actually, we don't develop software. And that's okay because you're a billion dollar company that is making money and you just buy off the shelf software. You just go to Oracle, you just go to blah, 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 and you buy it off the shelf and you implement it. But maybe you don't need to know the CI bit, but I would strongly believe that in years to come, you're going to need to know that CD bit. You're going to need to know continuous delivery of that software because I don't want to just download an ISO, attach it to my virtual machine, click next, 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 and install it. I would much rather go through that controlled CD pipeline because then I know if anything breaks, I'm just going to go back. I'm just going to roll back. And I think that gives us the flexibility, not only to do that, but also to test. Because I feel like test has maybe been a bit too hard over the last few years. So testing as much of, of that process is, is also massively important. But what I mean by that as well is that like programming language, I basically cherry picked a load of different topics. You're not, you don't need to know all of them. Or I doubt you need to know all of them is probably a good way of putting it yes absolutely absolutely on, on the topic of the ebook and so many good person like more voting for the ebook like ebook help kind of helps because it's easier to go through the pages plus one for the ebook and dummies like me are more with individuals so youtube as well so YouTube so this is something and i actually just published this last week like an hour long and i wanted to keep it under an hour i'm very conscious about people's time but it's the only real way that you can get through that amount of content so on my youtube channel i actually did an overview going through each of the sections in a very very brief um way um just say like this is what i did this is how i did it and the idea is is that we then take each section and we can we can create a video on each one for that um ebook is kind of an easy easy one because um in fact i don't know if i can share screen again but if you're on the repo and that ebook is of interest then i did a, a am i sharing yeah cool on um if you go down here to publishing.md again this is learning in public this is outside of it but steps to create an ebook like Ideally, I want to be able to take a fork and I want to make sure that it's available as a PDF download on an S3 bucket somewhere, safe for everyone to just go and download and not take anyone's detail. I don't really care, but I'd like to see the metrics, how people doing it. Um, but yeah, things like that. But basically, if you want to if you want to create your own ebook, you can do that by getting to grips and using something called Pandoc. Go through here run run through some of these commands we could put it to word or we could send it to a pdf as well so and then again that that typical resources for much smarter people than me down the bottom as to where i got that so that's that's like we can, we can do that now um i feel like like i i've got a front and rear cover as well to go with it if you wanted to do that but i'll, I'll definitely look into that ebook option as well especially for the virtual um, CubeCon attendees as well, I think is 
I think you're right. I think people learn that way and people learn the visual and the YouTube way, podcasts, etc., where they can get on with something else as well. People have different brains, right? So I think that's uh, that's and that's awesome feedback as well from the community. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And before we have discussed wonderfully well, and the one question, like let's say, if the new students are diving into the DevOps, there is so much into it. They need to know Linux. They need to know the how to run terminal command in the terminal to do scripting things. And then they need to know the code and how to build it, how to de- how to make dependencies out of it. So can you list them? We have some wonderful roadmaps, the road DevOps roadmap 2022 by Sam Patek, yeah. Jack Word with Nana. These are the people doing so much good content for the community out. But what's your ladder for the DevOps? Like it's ladder is already already given into the repo, to be honest. But for the students, like they they want to do the DevOps. And do you think the student should directly go to the DevOps or they spend two, three hour, hour months or year in the building or de- building and developing application in programming languages first? And then you'd ship into the DevOps world. No. So that's a, it's an awesome question. And I would take three things out of that repo right now. One would be Linux. Linux, you will find Linux everywhere and you will for the next 10 years you could spend 10 years just profiling yourself as a linux administrator learn linux the fundamentals of it i like convert a laptop get a virtual machine that you literally touch linux daily like do, try and do your schoolwork your like your work that's i did that and i i will i will always be a linux user um, the second bit is understand the, the pla- a platform. So, and that this is going to depend really on like his, your background and where where you want to go, because a platform for me is physical, virtual, cloud, cloud native, and that includes serverless. Now you could all go out there and go and start to learn things like Open FAS and. And, and other like functions as a service, serverless, Lambda, et cetera. And that's great. I feel like you need to get that understanding of maybe even virtualization or cloud so that you understand that compute, the networking and the storage layers. Get that un- fundamental infrastructure understanding. And then finally is about go and learn one of those cloud providers. Go and learn something about AWS, about Azure, about Google, or anything that obviously is of interest to you to understand. Because I'd say that if, and I put this in the repo as well, if you learn one of those clouds, Microsoft Azure, for example, that's what I did, that's what I went through. If you understand that, know that AWS and Google and Oracle and Mr. Service Provider or Mrs. Service Provider, they all revolve around compute, networking, and storage. They might have some funky names for them, um, and they have a lot more services that do a lot more things. But generally speaking, there is that, there's a marry up of, they do this, like what does a virtual machine look like in Google? What does it look like in Azure? What does it look like in AWS? Ultimately, they're all virtual machines. They're all IaaS. Um, Google have their compute engine. AWS have their EC2 instances, Azure have Azure virtual machines. Understand that all the way down, and maybe that's a good little cheat sheet that I'd love to see from someone in the community. There's a lot of correlation because ultimately, and and obviously some do have differentiators, but they're all in business. They're not free, um, so they're trying to win the race. Um, But generally speaking, there's going to be an IaaS solution, there's going to be a PaaS solution, there's going to be other services, Kubernetes services as well around that. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's it's all about, as you mentioned, compute network in storage. That's same for the virtual machine if you are using the virtual machine. And I think that's same pretty much if you are using the containers, compute, network, and storage. 
It's all about IT, DevOps, is the three word. Because these three word created is, and because if you're talking about compute, compute had its own ecosystem. If you're talking about network, networking had its own ecosystem. If you're talking about storage, it has its own ecosystem. And yeah. that's same for the container as well. We have so much vendors doing storage things. We have so much vendors doing networking things. We have so much vendors doing container runtime, container build kits, or uh, container registries, or securing the containers, or making sure you have a very small image or five MVF images. So it's all about three words. And I think everybody who's listening to watching to us, you should keep an eye out. If, I think if, if you learn one thing, like as you mentioned, like if you know a bit about Azure, because I spent so much time in the Azure, when you look at the AWS, thing names are changed, but to be honest, like concepts and the the way we think about cloud is similar on all these three cloud providers. Yeah. So having a knowledge of one give you the you can map your existing knowledge to the other cloud provider. And I think Microsoft and AWS also created their guides how you can use your existing knowledge of. You can map those language map those existing knowledge as well, and all those guides as well. And also you mentioned like if somebody created a guide on all these mapping points, how you can move from this to this, this is this going to be awesome. Absolutely. And that's a great way of contribution. Listening to us, it gets a great idea for anyone to start thinking about it and start start making contribution out of it. So I think I think the other thing, obviously, with, a, with it being a cloud native user group meetup, I think the one nod would be around like go and learn Kubernetes, but you don't necessarily need to know all the nuts and bolts of Kubernetes. You don't like I drive a I drive a car, but that doesn't mean I know the engine. I don't know anything about it. I put like, an expert can do that, but I can leverage the platform of Kubernetes. And so another project, this is a shameless plug, but there's another project that I've done within the another repo, and it's called Project Pace. In fact, let's just have a look. Um, and it's basically about streamlining that and speeding up the um, the uh, the ability to spin up a, a, a Kubernetes environment wherever. Like, again, it's very cost effective. It's about being able to run it locally on your own system, regardless of operating system. And it's basically using Minikube to do that. I really like Minikube because it has these add-ons that enable you to, like, spin up a lot of different things so basically what it does is we're going to deploy a kubernetes cluster on your local machine um <coughs> we're going to use another cool product or tool called arcade um so get minikube up and running then we install k10 to back up the data because ultimately we're going to push out a mysql database with some important information on there and then we're going to use k10 to protect it form a backup of it and then recover that and then delete the cluster. We can also export to a min IO. So deploy object storage into your cluster. Just like, and, and I feel like there's not enough of these in the world, Like these walkthroughs are hitting the easy button so that you can just get hands on because getting hands on puts something into our heads that we know how to do. If you just go to someone and just go, Oh, go and build a Kubernetes cluster. But I feel like the challenge, or well, that's quite a daunting thing to be asked. Um, also in here, I've done some other stuff around like Zero to Hero. That's using Pac-Man if you wanted to play a game on your local Minikube cluster, backing up the high scores. Um, I've started working on something around Argo CD and integrating backup into your CD pipeline so that anyone can really um, build these out. Like I, I want to make it like workshop, type stuff but offline but just freely available to everyone as well and maybe when this bolsters out then then i can come back and and give a give a good demo on what this looks like as well and and do a session on minikube itself yes, absolutely absolutely and last time i i share some uh, poll on the twitter what the best way to teach kubernetes and that's incredible to see people out think about it but to be honest with you, like the Minikube is a winner right there in, the, in, in this poll. So much love for it because during that days, 
when there is no Kubernetes distro, there's only Minikube. And now we have so many of them, K3S, K0S, K3D. We have so much of them. And we see um, another winner is also, uh, yes, that's one. I mean, we see a winner is also the mini give, and but we have so much good, uh, so much good th insight on that comments because everybody's listed their own flavor of Kubernetes. Some say the Civo is the best one because Civo has to be a best one because you have a three node cluster, a one to one node cluster. One node cluster is Kubernetes is good, but it's not very attractive. A three node, a highly available cluster can you 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 need to understand the, all the knowledge and sharing the knowledge how the three highly available cluster works and it's i think it's 90 seconds to spun up a cluster that's awesome with yeah. the civil uh, cloud as well so it's, it's been but with the kubernetes distro it's always been a challenging it's same as a linux distributions so much to choose which one to choose which for which use case if i choose which you if i choose this or over that how much the learning curve is well because all tool required you to be have some new command, some new way of thinking about it, and this kind of stuff as well. And we are approaching our, our mark now. And the final question: What do you think? Twenty twenty three is, I think, with, with right now with August. What's going to be happen? First, you tell us about your talks at KubeCon, if any, or Beam talks or Kubernetes storage talk that is happening in the KubeCon. That's right. And plus, what do you think? What do you think? It's coming up in the DevOps. Uh, so I think the biggest years. thing that will happen over the next 12 to 18 months is we're going to see an influx of that VI admin, that infrastructure admin come into this space. They're either going to inherit Kubernetes or have to have that awareness and build out. So our community is going to get much bigger very quick. Um, just so out of it, like so next week I'm off to San Francisco to VMware Explore. And I know that over 10% of their sessions there are focused on Kubernetes, which is quite incredible when you think about a virtualization platform playing that game and different personas then having to look after that. So I strongly believe that we're going to see an influx of, of new people that have a different mindset from a developer, even from DevOps, but the sysadmin, is, that is going to evolve. That role is going to evolve. They should have called it VMware Evolve, but um, there you go. Yes, and one more, like you're telling like any Veeam Kubernetes storage talk in the KubeCon, that's right, coming up from your um, team or you. So I didn't get a call. I didn't get a um, session accepted at KubeCon, but I will be running um, or helping to run Cloud Native Data Management Day, which is going to be on the Tuesday afternoon. If anyone's lucky enough to get over to uh to detroit everyone please come in we'll have good laid back community sessions We've got some great speakers canal is actually going to come and speak with us so that should give you an idea of like what we're trying to achieve there like it's free there's no ticket price come come on down have a conversation there's gonna be some great sessions i feel like actually that data management space if you think about all things storage all things data and everything in between. I think that world is absolutely going to hot up over the next 12 to 18 months as well. People are absolutely running data services within Kubernetes, but then they're also taking advantage of the cluster, the data running outside. For example, like you might have your front end running in Kubernetes for all the scalability, but then you might be leveraging something like Amazon RDS. And that's fine, but how are you protecting that RDS and how are you protecting your app? So that's where my brain goes. It's, I'm always thinking about the worst case, the, the fire, flood and blood type scenarios or ransomware that doesn't really rhyme with any of them three. Whereas, um, yeah, so I, I think there are, that's another big area. I think databases, storage options within Kubernetes. I think we should be well past that state, uh, stateless versus stateful conversation now look at the last three releases of kubernetes they've all contained some um they've all contained something around storage the csi various like migration to csi etc which just enables us to run run more stateful workloads within kubernetes so i think that's another big area that we're going to see next year 
Yes, absolutely. And Kubernetes 1.25 release is coming up. And you look at the look at the new feature enhancement, many of them in the storage space. And that that's give you the reflection of what we are talking about. You see yeah. some of the Azure Kubernetes storage updates. And it's, it's happening so rapidly. People build communities out of it. And then Jatter and Kubernetes is a good community to get hang out yeah. into it. And if you have any question about storage, Michael is the guy for you to hang out and share some insight of these kind of stuff, uh, because he's working with a wonderful company, the number one backup storage in Kubernetes, cast in by Veeb. And we have also did a session on the Kubester cast in on this channel with Michael K. This is this is their second appearance on 2022, and we're looking forward to have more and more collaboration with Michael K. as well. So wonderful talking to you, Michael. It's been a great talking to you. And keep an eye out. Eye out. Hope you, you can see an ebook. Hopefully you can see a playlist. Also, he has YouTube channel and he's talking about all his repositories. Right? And is all the, I, I see every day a few, new update to the GitHub repository. Michael is not kind of a person which make contribution in that slave, slave and go away. He's making those contribution consistently and continuously and making changes every day and adding more and more stuff into it so it's a very good learning journey for everybody to hang out to us so thank you everyone who showed up share your question with us and enjoy the conversation stay safe stay healthy bye bye everyone